everybody to our welcome everybody to our event on decolonizing digital education. Um, this event has been co-produced by three institutions, LIDC, the University of London Center for Online and Distance Education, and the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange. I'm Professor Claire Heffernan, I'm the director of LIDC, and for those of you who don't know us, just a very brief introduction. Um, we are a consortium of seven University of London institutions. Um, so as LSHCM, UCLIOE, RVC, Birkbeck School of Geography, QMUL, and City, we support interdisciplinary research. We currently have over 6,400 members that work across all areas of global development. So please do follow us on, on Twitter and LinkedIn and sign up for our newsletters. So over to you, uh, Linda, to introduce our other uh, institutions. Oh, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> so, um, yes, thank you very much for joining us today. And thanks to Claire for, um, for, for hosting us. So the event's been coordinated by three organizations, all part of the University of London Federation. Um, and I'm just going to introduce two of those. So. Um, my name is Linda Amran Cooper, and I'm Director of Academic Practice at the University of London. And I also head up our Centre for Online and Distance Education. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted to work with Shireen at LIDC and Julian in Blee, which we'll, I'll say a little bit more about, to build this opportunity for discussion on such an important topic. Um, the Centre for Online and Distance Education, CODE, which is our, our code word for ourselves, uh, is a University of London initiative to support the development of expertise and innovation in the field of online and distance education. And we do that through research, training, capacity building, outreach and dissemination and strategy and policy development. Two of my colleagues from CODE are with us today, Christine, our chair, and Oscar, one of the panellists. Within the Centre for Online and Distance Education community, we have a special interest group that focuses on decolonisation in online education. And we look forward to hearing more from this, from Oscar on this. Uh, before I hand back to Claire to introduce our panel, I'll just say a little bit about the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange, which is the third partner in this event. And Julian Bream, from, who's unable to attend today has asked that I give a brief intro to the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange, BLEE. So we've got code and we've got BLEE and we've got LIDC, plenty of letters. So BLEE is set up so that the University of London institutions can share innovative practice, help staff meet their peers, form special interest groups and collaborate to put on events and share resources. You might be interested that BLEE's current project is using the experience of PhD students from across the institutions to create a MOOC to help widen access to PhD research. They're particularly exploring developing a MOOC for inclusive approaches within HE inter internationally. So I'll hand back to Claire now, who's going to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much. Yeah, th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda, for that. Um, I'm going to introduce our chair, uh, Dr. Christine Theranira McKeever. Um, Christine is, and more detailed bios will be going into the chat, so please do look at that, but I'm just a very brief introduction, Christine. Uh, Christine's the Vice Principal for Quality, Diversity, and Inclusion at the Royal Veterinary College. She's responsible for the strategic direction and leadership for the postgraduate uh, distance learning programs at RVC. She did her PhD at the University of Edinburgh. Um, where I was, where I first met Christine, oh, so many years ago. Uh, her education research interests are around learning design um, and enhancing the student experience. But Christine, we are absolutely delighted that you could join us today. I'm going to uh, give you the floor. The floor is now yours. Thanks very much, Claire. And hello to everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so, I think to start us off, the first thing I will do is introduce my colleagues who are going to speak with us today. Um, I have to say I'm very pleased to be a part of this, um, this session, which is a collaborative effort between three institutions, 
all of which I'm a member of and all of which do such a huge amount of, of really good work around development, international development. Um, so without further ado, what I'm going to do is, first I'll, I'll introduce our panel and then we'll have a little bit of a preamble to, to our session today and then we will kick off with, um, with the session. So our first speaker today is going to be um, Oscar Mwanga. Now Oscar, Dr. Oscar Mwanga is the Programme Director for International Sport Management um, at the University of London. And he's also an emeritus associate professor with Salent University. Oscar is my colleague um, at CODE, um, to, use, to use the code word. And um, his research and activism work there focuses on decolonizing higher education, sports industry, and international development. And as Linda said, um, Oscar contributes to the collective work of the decolonizing working group in CODE. And of course, the work around that is the aim of that work is to inspire, lead, and support um, the work towards decolonizing in the University of London. Our second speaker today is going to be Dr. Romini Istrati. Romini, I'm very pleased to meet you finally, um, in a real sense. And Romina is UKRA Future Leaders Fellow at the School of History, Religions and Philosophies at SOAS. Um, she's a principal investigator of the UKRI funded project um, titled Bridging Religious Studies, Gender and Development and Public Health to Address Domestic Violence, a novel approach for Ethiopia and the UK. And I think in general terms, Romina, it's right to say you're a critical development thinker and practitioner with many years of experience in, in, um, in developing cosmology sensitive and people centered methodologies and approaches for analyzing and addressing issues with gender dimensions and religious societies of Africa. Now, in terms of decolonizing, Romina is very involved in, in this work in a very practical sense. And for example, um, Romina co-founded um, Colonial Subversions, which is an open access the open access diversification of knowledge production. And our final speaker today is going to be Salamawit Ritter. Now, Salamawit is um, currently working as a software project manager. And Salamawit holds a BS in computing, computer engineering, and an MBA, and also a bachelor's degree in theology, and currently studying for a master's degree also in theology with Agora University. Now, these three speakers that we have today are going to speak to us from a very different, diverse perspectives around decolonizing of digital education. And just to, set, to start us off thinking about digital education, um, conversations around decolonizing so far have very much tended to focus on decolonizing of curricula and decolonizing of pedagogies. And I, I think it's right to say that really there hasn't been a lot said yet around decolonizing of digital education. Now, with a pandemic, suddenly digital education has become the mainstream for a long time. The digital world was very much a peripheral, was peripheral, if you like, to, to, to the central ways in which we did education. But it is now here, most institutions at the very least have a blended offering, therefore there's an online element in most of the education post-pandemic. And it is right that we start thinking about decolonizing and the decolonial elements um, around digital education, given how essential it is to, to our education systems at the moment. Now, I've been an educator for, of distance learners for a long time. And one of the things that's been recognized over time are the issues around accessibility and the inequalities that exist when it comes to that online, online space and the provision of digital education. But in all the years, the sorts of the mitigations around some of these issues around accessibility and the inequalities, I think they've been very much focused on technological solutions, you know, thinking about low bandwidth solutions, you know, thinking, oh, we'll find a way in which we make this accessible to users in you know, in low resource settings, typically people in the global south. And the trouble with this, the solutions, some have worked, some haven't worked so well, but of course, these have all been very much centered within the existing systems, within the existing structures. They're very much centered around the knowledge, the interpretation, the understanding, the contexts of those in the global north. And therefore, in a way, they've not been 
fundamental. They've not really gone to the heart of the issue as a lot of issues around decolonizing have not. And therefore there's been no space, no inclusion of that user in the global South for whom these inequalities actually do mean a lot that has not been understood and a lot that's not been taken into consideration when thinking about what we're designing, thinking about what's being offered in that um, online education space. So there is a lot to say um, in, in this area and I'm very pleased that we've got these three colleagues um, speaking to us, we're very fortunate. Therefore, without further ado, what I'm going to do is I'll ask, um, our first speaker is going to be Oscar. And um, Oscar is going to really look at um, broadly the decolonizing, decolonization dialogue between the global north and the global south. And um, the specific focus is going to be on understanding mechanisms of modernity, coloniality, and in order to progress that intercultural dialogue um, in both in digital education and in other spaces. So straight after Oscar, Romina is going to speak with us and I'll introduce Romina at, at that point. And what we'll do after the speakers, we'll just have the three um, speakers in, in succession and then we'll have a, um, some time for a group discussion, which we'll all look very much look forward to. So Oscar, over to you. Thank you, uh, Christine. Thank you so much for that uh, uh, introduction, and uh, thank you to the to the to the organisations that are, are hosting this uh, uh, talk today. Um, it's really a, a, a pleasure for me to to join you in this conversation today. Um, I would like just to pick up from what Christine said, which I thought was a very uh, very thoughtful introduction. There, this idea that um, a lot is being left out in the conversation because. Maybe the key vested interest in this conversation, which is the global south, is invisible and silent. And uh, all we can make is estimation about what they think. All we can make is estimation of how they see the world. Now, what I am wary of is that we are drifting into issues. And when we drift into these issues around specific issues around, you know, uh, digital literacy, digital access to, to education and, and, and other issues like that, we tend to forget what the real debate is all about. We tend to forget the, the foundational issues. We tend to forget uh, what is the root causes of these uh, inequalities. So therefore, my conversation really is to try and uh, pick up on a few things that have been said in, 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 in the decolonization movement, which is also the frustration around are we having a progressive conversation? Are we getting anywhere with this? And um, I, I, I come from uh, a tradition where we believe when we stop talking, then that's when we actually die. That's when we stop to exist. And I think we need to keep talking, but what we need to do is to think of how, what is the content of this conversation? What is the, the, the intellectual engagement that we're bringing into this conversation? Uh, and, and I think, that is the focus of my discussion today. I would like to sort of like attempt to unveil some mechanisms of modernity, coloniality, so that we can begin to progress this dialogue, the intercultural dialogue between the global north and the global south. Um, because I believe that honestly, there is still a lot that uh, can be done. Um, in my um, talk, I, I will use a few slides if, if, if I can just uh, share that. Uh, can you see my slides, Christine, confirm for me? Yes, all good, Oscar, I can see them. Thank you very much. So um, I guess the, the right place to start, uh, 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 friends, is, uh, is, 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 is almost like a very personal uh, place of where I think we all have to be thinking about our location in this space. Um, to think really that uh, because you you're coming from an academic background or because you you know uh, you have a certain level of education you are going to be objective about your worldview you're going to be objective about, about what you see I think that is really uh, a, a, an outworking of, of of modernity itself and I think what we need to be thinking about what I am challenging myself to think about is this truth that actually, I am located in, I am produced by my location, my positionality in terms of my, uh, my ethnicity, uh, my positionality in terms of my gender, in terms of my class, in terms of the experiences that I've had, 
abroad to my square engagement. And I think it has to be my responsibility to actually uh, expose that. Uh, to the extent that I expose that, hopefully you will, you're, you're not going to see the usual uh, masculine uh, depiction of myself, which is the strong person, but you're going to see the totality of me, which is also some of the biases that I have the totality of me, which is some of the vulnerabilities that I have, because that is what it means to be fully human. It's, it, you know, it has to be that um, uh, completeness. But um, I cannot talk about, you know, one way to bring and to discuss my position, uh, positionality is to, is to unmask uh, some of those uh, hegemonic assumptions that I bring into that space. Uh, and, and that is uh, calling on this idea of a critical uh, reflexivity. It's really, do I have the tools, the resources within myself to stand in front of the mirror and have a conversation with myself, to expose within myself how I, through my privileges and, and, and through my uh, experiences, I bring certain um, uh, advantages that others don't have. I also, therefore, reproduce certain inequalities. Um, if I want the world to be better, I have to start to becoming to, be, to, to becoming better myself. And this is one way um, I, I do that. So, so the question then I ask, I ask here is, uh, before we can have this dialogue, how do we begin to open ourselves individually from that perspective? Uh, how do we begin to locate our own colonialness? Uh, how do we begin to expose our colonial power, our privileges, our, 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 and how we relate to others? What are our responsibilities in this space? I think that that, that is crucial for me. Now, I've outlined there, uh, you know, these, these, these multiple identities of me. Um, and I can just speak a little bit, maybe uh, about one or two of those. So I can start to show uh, you colleagues uh, uh, what I mean by opening up, uh, you know, to, to make a, uh, for good conversation. So I am originally from Zambia. Uh, and I have um, an education which has, has happened in two spaces. You know, the, the very formal education, which was completely British education, uh, Zambia having been uh, a former colony of, of, of the empire. And then I, 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 alongside that, I did have the traditional education, which was not something that you were proud of, but I was put in that education. It happened in silence because it was it was it was overpowered and overwhelmed by the the hegemonic uh, Western uh, education. But within that education, I I was privileged because I'm a, I'm a male. The privileges that I have, my sisters didn't have. When there was an issue of whether uh, there's limited resources to go to school, I was more likely to be given an opportunity to go to school compared to my sisters. So that comes with me when I come into this space. I cannot pretend to you that you know I'm completely objective about all these things. There are those things that I bring with me, which uh, are inherent advantages that others will not have, and it's important for me to bring that into the space when we're having a conversation uh, in, in in the global south or in the global north. Uh, as as an academic, uh, I I am I, I am unique in the sense that I I am black um, diaspora and academic. I literally sit on the bridge. Now, on this bridge that I sit, and I'm glad we're talking about the divide. So on this bridge that I sit, I struggle a lot because I literally exist in two places. I, I, I have had my education and I work in the Global North. I, I have my relatives, my family in the Global South. So I'm, I'm, I'm privy to conversations that can be very uncomfortable uh, because they're in private spaces. I, I, I can sit in a village. I have sat in a village and... Uh, you know, people literally saying, you know, uh, today it's it's, uh, it's going to be a good, um, you know, school project or whatever we're doing because the people who are running it uh, are from Britain and they are white, and it's allowed as a normal conversation. Then, then I take that to the bridge, and and, and then I'm beginning to actually have a feel of the depth of this uh, of this colonization as it is uh, working out in that space. Uh, do I, I am I going to challenge it every time? I come into a certain spaces in the global north. And I see that I am actually privileged to be on the bridge, but it's also uh, it's a struggle to, to, to exist in that space. So a conversation like the one I'm having today, it can just be a simple one for anyone, but for me, it's my heart and mind in there. So as I, as, as I engage uh, with you on this topic, it's very important that I challenge you to start to reflect yourself 
Where do you locate yourself? Where is your positionality? Uh, what responsibilities do you have? What opportunities do you have that others don't have? And then how do we bring that into the, into the conversation that we are having today? So my question uh, here is, is really to look at how can we keep talking? How can we have this dialogue that acknowledges our differences, uh, um, you know, in, uh, cultural di uh, differences, our worldviews um, in a space where we know we can expose what we have in common and we can also have a conversation of what we don't have in common. Uh, and then we know this works, we know this is a good thing, but how is it not happening? What are the ways that are frustrating this dialogue? Uh, and, and, and how can we begin to sort of like understand that? So then obviously my question there is really to try and apply this in the context of, uh, of, uh, of, of digital uh, education, but I won't be you know, delving so much into that, but I'll be talking more broadly about these issues uh, around the, the, the mechanisms. So uh, I'll use the context of, of, of the program that I, I run at the University of London. And uh, this program is the International uh, Sports Management Program. And as you can see on your screen, it's for us, it's not just a program, but it, it, it within the sense of, 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 of decolonization, it's actually um, more than a program, it's a community. And what you see there is a representation of this community. And broadly, we sit in this wider community of over 50,000 students on our, on our, on our online uh, distance education programs, 50,000 students uh, from different cultural backgrounds. If you look at my program, we've, we've got over 71 nationalities. Uh, we've got uh, people representing all the, all, all, the, you know, all the continents there. Then the question becomes, if we, uh, if we see ourselves as having a conversation uh, with, with our students, uh, what are our values? What is our belief system that informs our engagement with our students? And in our program, we have said to ourselves that we are a program that is founded on, on a humanistic pedagogy. Uh, and one uh, example of that pedagogy is the Ubuntu pedagogy. The Ubuntu pedagogy is informed by uh, this idea that I am made human through you uh, to the extent that you are, I am. It is a Southern African uh, pedagogy that we have agreed as a program to try and, 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 and sort of like make it as a basis upon which we engage with our students. So our engagement is, 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 is around uh, the, the, the journey that our students are taking with us. And that journey that the students are, are taking with us is, is this decolonizing journey that helps them to understand uh, the, the, the pedagogical basis of our teaching, you know, how our courses are designed uh, and how we, 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 you know, we come up with our, our, our reading list. All this really to, to be underpinned by certain beliefs. And this belief is that we are all human. And the most important experience that our students will have with us is a, is a humanizing experience. And it, with the tutors and with the students, we constantly try to have the conversation of what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be to feel dignified? What you know? What is just a mere story? If a student comes in and gives a presentation and they can cite uh, references within their uh, their culture, if they can tell positively their story, are we happy to say we've given them that dignity to say that their knowledge, their story is valued within our space? So this uh, Ubuntu pedagogy. Uh, has a number of elements in there. And what I want you to do is to draw upon these elements and then try to think of modernity and, uh, and coloniality and see where the disruption will be happening. So in this pedagogy, the Ubuntu pedagogy, which was coming from philosophy, it was promoted by people like Mandela, Desmond Tutu. We talk about compassion, we talk about care, collaboration, uh, cooperation, respect, and dignity. Are these elements important in modernity? Does modernity need these elements to, 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 to be there for it to exist or for it to create its realities, or does it actually erase these? Now, if it does erase, then we understand that we need to actually promote them because we live in a, in, in a world that is constructed under this idea of modernity. So this mechanism I want to talk to, I want to, talk to you about uh, very quickly that um, I have very limited time, is um, what is this idea of uh, uh, modernity uh, coloniality? Uh, what is this? Uh, what are these mechanisms? Uh, 
uh, and, and I'll propose that this mechanism of uh, appropriation, this mechanism of representation, and uh, I'll discuss with you the idea of relationality and relationality and the task of listening. And I'll be posing this question to say, if we look at these mechanisms, if we engage with these mechanisms, are we going to then change our conversation? Is our, our conversation going to take a different uh, trajectory? But then before we get into that conversation, very important to remind ourselves, what exactly do we mean by decolonization? When I say decolonization, uh, is it your idea of decolonization? And if it's not, then we, we do have a problem already. Now in the global north, there's been a conversation that's going on uh, since it, before COVID uh, with a new wave of decolonization, which was really about the, you know, why is my, uh, my curriculum white? Um, and then the response to that was, you know, we need to diversify the curriculum. Now, the, the, the trouble with that is that it leaves out the politics of, 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 of decolonization. Um, and, and the trouble with, 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 with some of the technologies like internationalization that are being used to replace decolonization is that they don't include uh, the elements of ethics, the elements of power. Uh, and these elements are crucial and because if we leave them out, then we are going to be leaving out the very key things that we need to, to, to deconstruct for us to construct a, a better future. So, 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 so decolonization for me, it has to include this, 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 these dimensions that are, are outlined there. It has to include an extra dimension, which is not captured in one word, but this is creating alternative worlds. Uh, it's, it's, it's about creating what we, we don't have. It's about being able to imagine. It's about looking to a future and then seeing what, uh, an alternative future. Now, it's been ascribed to uh, uh, um, Albert Einstein that he said, you know, uh, imagination is the most superior form of intelligence. I'd like to pick on that and really say, sometimes when you are locked away into one particular worldview or even in a physical space or as a prison, one of the things you have is your imagination. You need to see ahead, you need to see somewhere else. And, and I, 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 I am challenging my students, I'm challenging myself to have that imagination of beyond this place. What is that future we can work towards? So as we journey towards that future, uh, we need to continue to believe that the conversation is good and it's leading us there. Uh, and, 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 and one of the things we can be sure about is to see ourselves clearly. Uh, we might not be very clear exactly where we're going, but we know that we are, we are not happy with the place where we're at and we're moving towards uh, a better place. So we cannot talk about, the, uh, we cannot talk about um, uh, you know, mod modernity without coloniality. We, modernity and coloniality are, the two faces of the same coin. They are in- Oscar, I'm sorry to interrupt, just to say we're, we're running short of time. So we've got a few more minutes. Two more minutes, okay, I'll try and run through that. So yeah, so, so, so basically we're saying that um, we cannot talk about um, you know, uh, modernity uh, uh, without actually uh, looking at coloniality. That's the dark side, but it has to be the full picture of it. Uh, and when we try to think of uh, of, of, of modernity uh, coloniality, we're talking about the divide. In, 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 the, in the blurb of, of this discussion today, we're talking about the divide. And what this divide creates is what you see on your screen there, that there's, a, there's this world and there's that world. These sometimes need to be seen within these, uh, uh, within these, uh, mechanisms, we need to see them differently as creations of modernity um, uh, coloniality. And, and, and what we need to ask ourselves is the question of how then can we use the understanding of these mechanisms to try and create a different uh, kind of understanding. And, and I'll be, um, you know, so the, that, that mechanism of uh, rationality is really going back to the question of saying, you know, are we one thing as humans or are we other things, you know? Um, the, the, this, this, this dichotomy, this idea that there's, there's always a binary is what uh, coloniality modernity promotes. But can we challenge that thought? Can we see uh, relation as, as one? Can we see that we are not just uh, binaries all the time? Can we challenge that uh, thought? And, and, and we begin to see through appropriation and, and, and representation that these have been taken by uh, modernity, uh, coloniality, uh, and, and they have monopoly over this. You know, the, the, the reality we see is a creation, which is a representation. Uh, and, and the appropriation is uh, the ability of, of, of modernity, uh, coloniality to, to actually, um, uh, 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 you know, take over worlds and then name the worlds uh, through the, 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 the monopoly that, that it has uh, in, in, in the visibility and, and in, in tangibility as can be seen there. 
So uh, very quickly, I, I'm jumping on to this task of listening. Um, modernity struggles to listen uh, to anything we, uh, outside it, itself. One of the things that we have to do is to break open um, uh, modernity, coloniality, so that it begins to listen outside. So we cannot start talking about, we're not listening to Global South uh, 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 academics and, 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 and collaborating partners if we don't challenge ourselves in the Global North, the fact that we are at the center of this modernity. And it's, it's, we, we don't have to clean our ears to listen. We have to find out our ears listening outside or our ears listening inside. So it's a very important for us to listen um, in a different way, to, to listen as a form of a critique, as, uh, as I've outlined there. So very quickly, I'll just jump on to the conclusion in um, uh, respect of time. And so in conclusion, our, our answer to progress this conversation is, 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 is to be found outside, um, you know, uh, modernity, uh, coloniality. Uh, but modernity must be humbled. It must be decentered. Uh, we must ask... Uh, the modernity to listen to others. We must go to the design, to the mechanisms of, of, of what creates it to ask the question of, are you able to create another way of engaging with others? Because the current way of engaging uh, will not help you to actually have a better conversation. And so, uh, because the source and foundation of, 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 of the, for me, the, the, the colonial critique is really to be found with, a, with a, an honest and sincere engagement of the people in the global south who are not part of the conversation because the, uh, modernity, Christianity, uh, modernity, coloniality makes them invisible and it makes them uh, silent. And therefore, it's important that we go not just to these conversations around where we are not speaking to them, we need to go to the conversation around what makes us, what makes modernity, coloniality not to listen to the outside and not to see the outside. Thank you very much. I had to rush through that. Uh, over to you, uh, Christine. Thank you, Oscar. That's really very thought provoking and, and so much covered. And I'm sorry we had to stop just in the interest of time, but th there is a lot to unpack then, and a, a huge amount that, that we can talk about. So, um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of commentary and a lot of questions and colleagues um, in attendance, please, as we go along, do post your questions in the Q&A um, chat box, not, not the chat box, the Q&A box, and so that we can come back to these um, at the end of the, um, of the presentations. So thanks very much, Oscar. We'll come back to, to try to unpick and unpack some of these um, areas that, that you've highlighted and the issues that you've brought up. Um, Thank you. Okay. We'll now have our second speaker, um, Dr. Romina Strati. So Romina, I believe you're going to share with us some of your reflections based on some time that we spent working in the community, and you'll be looking at the significance of paying attention to internet inequalities, and also maybe thinking a little bit about implications for equitable research and collaborative practices. Over to you. Thank you so much, Christine, and thank you, Oscar, for this excellent contextualization. Uh, I have a few slides which I was able to put together, so I'm happy to share something visual uh, with everyone so that uh, it's not just my boring voice. <laughs> uh, I think you can see that, Christine, right? Yep, I can see it. I think everybody excellent. Can Fantastic. excellent. And I'll uh, just to say, I'm going to pass through very quickly to share some reflections. Uh, I will start with my positionality at, because, as Oscar said, it's really important to start thinking of how we relate to this uh, debate and effort to decolonize, uh, starting with ourselves. And uh, I, Christine already made a very generous introduction of myself, but I just wanted to sort of position myself so that you know where I'm coming from in this uh, conversation. And again, to say that there are so many other voices that could replace mine and uh, they would they would have something more important to say. Uh, but I'm very happy to share what I've been doing. I've been uh, for the past two years been based in Ethiopia, primarily uh, leading a project that aims to uh, you know, it takes a decolonial approach to responding to domestic violence uh, in Ethiopia, and it aims to reverse the knowledge transfer by feeding the knowledge uh, and the evidence in Ethiopia to the UK uh, domestic violence sector so that it caters better to um, ethnic minority and migrant populations of a religious background. So uh, I'm, I've been working very much in reversing the knowledge transfer, which has been historically from sort of the West to the rest, if I may put it sort of plainly. Um, and, and myself, I, I, I have 
have found it important to be based in the Global South, to be based in Ethiopia, uh, to be based in the community I work with in order to not only understand what the context is that we're facing and, and the challenges and also learn uh, by being there um, and, and, and you know, be able to support my colleagues and partners and, and the various uh, teams that I work with. Uh, but I feel that that's important in order to have an insight into different perspectives, really, uh, not just uh, by being based, you know, listening to voices in our location in the global north, but actually seeing and living different realities and learning from them. Um, I wanted to start with this uh, kind of visualization of the system, as I understand it, uh, an unequal system that Oscar really sort of dealt into. So I don't really need to say, say anything. I just wanted to kind of center on the fact that uh, we do have uh, this historical epistemological inequality whereby Western knowledge tends to dominate, uh, Anglo-American in particular, um, but also other you know, knowledge coming from Western societies in general. Um, and, and that knowledge tends to be, it tends to dominate despite efforts made to diversify uh, knowledge production in the world because it's underpinned by material inequalities and structural inequalities. And those are inequalities in funding, the distribution of funding, inequalities in the distribution of publishers in the world. Most publishers are based in the global north. And so they set the agendas, uh, they set the standards and the norms. And, and those norms, uh, they might aim to be reflexive, but again, they're, they're biased by the very, um, you know, the basis of their situatedness. They're situated in a different context. Uh, and so they don't capture really the experiences and priorities of other contexts. Um, and and I don't I don't need to go into the the sort of the epistemological inequalities really because I'm focusing on the digital inequalities today. But I did want to define it. It's a term we academics use oftentimes, um, or we use in academic discourse. And I I like to define it because I understand that we have you know members of the public, people from different walks of life. Uh, when we say epistemology, we really mean the, the way we make knowledge uh, and the criteria for validating knowledge, um, how we know that what we know is valid, essentially. And, and what we're trying to say here is that people know differently based on the belief systems they've been socialized in. Uh, different belief systems will have different epistemologies, essentially, different criteria of thinking around knowledge and what is important knowledge and what is useful knowledge. Unfortunately, again, due to the uh, colonialism, imperialism, various other phenomena in the world, um, you know, Western European epistemology has dominated. Um, I have quoted Nugugi Wachiongo, uh, a Kenyan writer who has written in his own language, um, uh, who described this experience of colonialism, which was uh, you know, really uh, co comprehensive and holistic and really define people's existence and, and uh, um, dehumanize that existence. existence. Um, so in describing colonialism, Nugugu writes, uh, its most important area of domination was the mental universe of the colonized, the control through culture of how people perceive themselves and their relationship to the world. Uh, this is really what we mean by epistemological dominance. It's not just about controlling the science and what we know as valid science, but it's how we think of, our, of ourselves um, and our position in the world. Now, having said that, I wanted to really share some reflections on digital inequalities. I've, I, I, I'm really happy that Salam with Wisa. Salam is someone I work with in Ethiopia. She will tell you more about herself uh, and she can say so much more. And I really look forward to Salam's presentation. So just some reflections, two slides uh, on how I why I think internet inequalities need a bit more attention. Um, because again, access to knowledge is important, not only to criticize the knowledge that is being developed primarily in the global north, but also to access knowledge, more diverse knowledge and more international knowledge, right? So it's really to be able to criticize what is being created and written about our communities that we don't, uh, you know, by, by, by outsiders, to put it very sort of broadly, uh, but also it's to be able to feed back to this knowledge production more actively and really start deep diversifying that system. Now, digital inequalities exist, and I don't think we think enough about them. Uh, they could re result from, I have seen in my own experience, being in different countries uh, in my in over 12 years of, of doing the work I do. Um, there are digital inequalities due to internet coverage in certain geographical areas of the world. Uh, it could be due to crises like war, environmental crisis, but it could be just because coverage hasn't reached yet that area. 
Uh, there are lack, there might be lack of computers, laptops, and devices, and I know a lot of colleagues of mine don't have laptops. Uh, we have a laptop, an additional laptop in our project to share with anyone who doesn't have one to be able to do the work they need to do. Uh, and again, that reflects different economic capabilities, but also availability in local markets. We really need to think about those things. Um, internet is often accessed through mobile phones. Uh, I've worked in village communities. I've worked in urban communities. The mobile phones sort of dominate, but in the village, you'd have very simple mo mo mobile phones not smartphones, so they can do very limited things. Um, in the urban area, you'd have smartphones, again, more functionalities. Again, those differences and differentials have to be considered. Um, and, and again, phones don't have the same functionalities as laptops do. So there's so many students and researchers in the world who don't have laptops, don't have desktop computers, don't have big screens. They work through a mobile, maybe a small tablet, whatever they have available. And that means they don't have the possibilities to edit their documents in the same way. Um, present and presentation matters, unfortunately, to us. I mean, for whoever, whoever has assessed, a, a, you know, a, a written, um, you know, a text or has, you um, graded an essay, right? Presentation matters. And unfortunately, it puts people at a disadvantage when they cannot work on those presentation details. Uh, and in addition to that, we need to think of library subscriptions uh, and, and differentials in the world. There are many libraries in the world that don't have subscriptions to expensive journals. And of course, that it res restricts access to resources that students have. Uh, fewer resources means that the students cannot cite, perhaps, uh, as many, you know, they cannot have as many citations, they cannot read as vastly, and that can disadvantage their grades, it can disadvantage their performance, it can disadvantage, you know, how well they can engage in a, in a, in a debate in, you know, in their area of studies, and it doesn't reflect the ability or the effort of the student, which is an injustice. I just wanted to put this visual on the distribution of global publishers, because I, again, we need to understand that all these inequalities are under, underpinned by wider structural inequalities. As I said, the distribution of funding and the distribution of publishers, as you can see in these graphs, most publishers are in, the, in Western societies, U, US and UK, and that reflects also global publications. Um, and then I wanted to specifically refer to research, to the context of research, because this is really what I do. I think Salam really is the expert here in terms of students and education. I wanted to just share on research uh, and to say that um, it has been a challenge for us, for myself. You know, we have been not always able to participate effectively in international events uh, because of unstable connection at times. Uh, we have, um, you know, some areas, again, don't have good connectivity. Some areas have very good connectivity. Uh, oftentimes webinars happen out of work hours, which means that our Ethiopian partners are, are at home and in their home, they may not have the same connection that they have at the office. Um, presentation, because of interruptions now during the presentations, uh, presentations are less smooth and that might disturb the audience and the audience might lose interest. I think we've all done that. Um, and that doesn't really reflect the effort that has gone into the preparation of the presentation or the value of the content that is being presented, right? So it's still, it's very unfair. Um, and then, you know, meetings, uh, sometimes digital meetings don't work <clears throat> in research. Uh, again, another differential that we need to think about in the global north, you might be able to, you know, get everyone together in an online meeting, but it's, it doesn't always work in every context. There's different culture, there's a different pace of work. Um, you know, there's a different approach to human relationships. So all these differentials, again, are important and need to be considered. Uh, and I just wanted to refer briefly to decolonial subversions that Christine mentioned, which is a platform uh, that is, is an international platform, is not affiliated with any one single uh, geography or institution, it's independent, is a cooperative of people from 15 countries, uh, different countries from Asia, Africa, Europe, um, you name it. And what we aim to do there is to promote open access knowledge uh, in different languages, it's multilingual, and it's multimodal. It's, it's text, it's acoustic, it's audio, and it's also visual. So it's films and anything else that someone would want to share with the world, essentially in their own language and their own form of expression. Uh, and I think this is very important in our effort to really, um, th this, these are sort of our modus operandi, you can read it, I'm not going to read it out loud to not take any more time. Um, but really what we aim here is to become more open access and give everyone an opportunity to publish um, you know, and to share into that knowledge. And we are in particular, in particular cautious about these digital inequalities. So the platform, we have a website was built by colleagues in India, our Indian team, uh, and they made it user friendly from a Southern context perspective because they are there and they know how people sort of would approach it, uh, which is again, excellent to have that perspective. 
Um, we use media as much as we can. We use Academia ADU, so we upload on our website, but we also upload everything we publish on Academia ADU. Now, Academia ADU is not by definition open access because you need a sign, uh, you need a profile to sign in, but it's for it's free to some extent, to some degree. So we still use it for that purpose. We use YouTube, uh, SoundCloud, and various, various other platforms. And again, we try to 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 make sure that you can read well on a mobile because so it has to be mobile friendly uh, when you when you open the website on mobile. It has to look as good and as user-friendly as it does on, on desktop. Um, and finally, digitizing the source library. I want to end with this note, final slide, because I think, again, when we think of digital inequalities, we need to think how, what can we do from our different positionalities, whether we work in research and libraries, we are students, whatever, whoever we are, wherever we are. Um, and I think libraries in particular have a lot of, to contribute to that uh, through dig, 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 digitization, apologies, of their resources, making them more available. Uh, again, it's important because it's knowledge that belongs to other communities and should be ac accessible to them, but also it's because it becomes more easily and more, more, more accessible to critique and to, to feed into that conversation, right? And not have it be defined and represented by a single perspective. Um, so it's really about problematizing knowledge production and diversifying. And I'll end here. Uh, I really look forward to Salam's presentation and learning from it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Romina. That was a fantastic... Um reflection and account there of, of some of your experiences and, and it, it's the way in which you've, you've included digital education in the broader sense of, of the various things that we need to think about when it comes to knowledge production and, and access to, to different types of knowledge. So thank you very much for that. Um, and again, congratulations on decol decolonial subversion because I think that is the kind of practical step that we need to, to have in place in order to allow some of this um, to change things around a little bit when it comes to, to the transfer of knowledge and, and so on. So again, we'll come back, colleagues, please do um, post any questions that you have in the Q&A um, box, anything you, you want to ask Romina or Oscar preceding that. And our final speaker is going to be Salam. Um, Salam, thanks so much for joining us all the way from Ethiopia. And Salam is going to give us really a very reflective and I would say very authentic account of, of her experiences as, as a learner and based in the global south, studying for an online degree um, run by a, a university in North America. And Salam will, will talk to us about her experiences and, and some of the challenges. So we look, really look forward to, to hearing your, your reflections on this, Salam. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, so I like Romina and Oscar, I don't have a presentation. So you're going to be stuck with my <laughs> boring voice. But I think uh, as part of making uh, sharing my experience as authentically as possible, I'm just going to be here. <laughs> uh, so uh, basically, uh, as an Ethiopian citizen uh, who finished my bachelor's in theology, uh, and also started my uh, master's in online uh, uh, in an online platform. Um, I think uh, I can give a brief experience, uh, both from, uh, because I finished my bachelor's uh, at the beginning of the pandemics. So I also experienced uh, not only an online education uh, from the US, but also online education from Ethiopia too. So uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was actually finishing, uh, it was my the second semester of my uh, final year at my theology school. So uh, as everyone in the world, uh, our school was also in some sort of a panic mode. So uh, shifting from the uh, classroom education to the um, online education. So uh, most of the challenge that we faced during that time was of adapting to the technology. So uh, until then, uh, our school did not have any form of uh, online education. So like, it took us almost five or like six months in order to actually set up some sort of uh, like an, a, a platform so that stu students can register, students can actually get their course material. So that whole process was a very challenging process, not only really as a learner, but also as, as, as educator, like the school had to go through a lot of challenges, like adjusting, like buying the platform by itself was a very big challenge because uh, even though our theological uh, school actually followed 
the modern uh, form, it wasn't really ready for this kind of uh, challenges. But I will majorly focus on my uh, education uh, with the university in North America. So I would actually uh, uh, divide my experience in three phases. So the first uh, phase is the preparation stage, the second stage is the learning process, and the third one is the research process. So uh, it's because all the challenges that I experienced in all these three stages were very different. That's why I wanted to uh, group them in these uh, three groups. So at the preparation stage, uh, it was after I finished my bachelor, I actually had to, because uh, I already planned to uh, continue learning my uh, master's, I had to find an institution. So there were three major challenge, challenge at this stage. The first one is finding an institution that had a curriculum that would actually accommodate my particular indigenous theological knowledge. So one of the, those was uh, one of my first challenge. So I had to find uh, some sort of a curriculum which actually can uh, incorporate my indigenous knowledge or else it, mean, it would mean that I had to start over. So this was one of the, the first challenges that I had. And also in this process, that uh, specific university also had to, I also had to afford that university. That's also a very big challenge because uh, in Africa, uh, I mean, like the payments is in dollar and it's going to be very high in the local currency. So I had to find somewhere that is going to either support me uh, with some sort of a scholarship or is actually uh, low enough that I can actually afford the uh, currency change. So that was my uh, second uh, challenge. So uh, the third challenge was that, uh, yes, uh, we learned uh, in, uh, in Ethiopia, uh, higher education is in English. Yes, I also uh, uh, took my bachelor's in theology in English. But when moving from an Ethiopian school to a Northern American school, language was a very big challenge. Yes, <laughs> I spoke English. Yes, I wrote my thesis in English, all of the things. But when it comes to educational English, it was a little bit challenging because especially at the first semester of my, uh, my education, uh, especially uh, making the turn from uh, speaking a normal English to actually finding the right ways of writing in academic English was a very big challenge. Uh, so these were uh, uh, my major challenges before I started school. So like the, having a financial support from the school. So very luckily my, the school that I actually found actually had um, had a program that would actually accommodate students from Africa in a very lower uh, tuition. So that was a very good uh, chance that I had. Uh, and also regarding the uh, uh, English, using English as an academic language in, in North America, uh, the, the school actually prepared like a separate course which would actually allow us uh, drive, uh, allow us like <laughs> go actually climb the stairs to actually having a good uh, uh, academic skill uh, in the uh, in, in the northern area. So that was those were the challenges in the preparation stage. So in the learning process, the first one was technology, obviously. Uh, so the first uh, challenge regarding the technology is that. Uh, at the at, uh, since I've told you that uh, it was at the uh, big uh, at the beginning at least I think it's six months after the beginning of the pandemic that I started my masters. Uh, since everybody was going online, work was online, and also school was online, there was a huge bandwidth problem in the country as a whole. So even though even though you could afford buying the internet, there was still a huge problem because everybody was using it, the infrastructure was not uh, uh, wide enough. So we had to share the small resources that we had. So that was a very big problem. Uh, not only the bandwidth, but like there, it, there was a continuous interruption. And also I was lucky enough to have a wireless in my home, but for most of my friends, it was very expensive. They had to use the uh, 4G internet to actually 
access the internet. So it was also very expensive. Uh, but not also that gadgets were also very uh, expensive. So uh, previously we had like we had our phone. Yes, it, most m many people had uh, their smartphones, but their smartphones uh, might not support the Zoom application. And especially Zoom was our only option back then. So we didn't have many other options that which are actually uh, less heavy. So all of these things were actually uh, challenges for me to. But also uh, uh, in the in the learning process, uh, the one of my other challenge were learning resources. So uh, as, I, as I, I told you that uh, my, the university I was learning was in North America. So most of the textbooks that uh, this universities used uh, were actually uh, from uh, authors. So actually finding our textbooks were a very big challenge. Uh, the, not only uh, finding uh, appropriate uh, resources, but uh, if we're lucky enough, we could actually find the resources. But actually shipping the resources was very hard because uh, after like, if we're lucky enough, if you have some uh, like a brother or sister in the US, you can actually buy it for us. But like shipping, it would take us like months. Like we have to find uh, people who would actually bring it to us. So it, it was very challenging. So most of us were actually forced to use pirate resources. Uh, not only that, uh, like actually citing these resources were very hard because we, uh, either found like uh, chunks of uh, pages missing. So like it really created a very hard uh, uh, scenario while actually uh, finding resources and actually uh, using resor resources. So the other one, uh, the other challenge uh, uh, I had is that uh, none of the resources that the school was using were actually from my indigenous theological uh, background. So I was really getting myself into a totally new world of education. Yes, I had a, my BTH, but it was, uh, I, I literally had to like learn uh, so many new things because most of the resources used are very new to me uh, as an Ethiopian. Uh, so uh, most of the time I couldn't relate my previously acquired knowledge to my new knowledge. So I'm sure I have to work at least <laughs> three times harder than whoever is uh, learning uh, in North America. Uh, so the other one, uh, uh, which actually I think can go hand in hand to what uh, Oscar says is that the problem of concept translation. So this, I came up with this word because uh, when you have uh, when you have uh, a, North, a North American uh, teacher who actually is accustomed to the North American uh, mindset, who has uh, presentive ideas which are very common to the Northern America, when that person is actually teaching to an African person, the student actually has to do like double the work because first he has to understand what the teacher has said. He has to actually contextualize what the teacher has said to his own context. So of course this goes uh, in the mind of the student, but this is this is very hard because we we might not share, especially in this in in, in the theological arena, uh, you might not share the same philosophical background or even mindset in order to understand each other. So yes, our world is very big. We can, we can actually talk to each other, but some, sometimes a, a, really, a gap really occurs because we want to really understand the mindset of the teacher. So like we have to do like, uh, we have to work twice as hard to actually understand him, like understand what he said and then actually contextualize what he said to my own context and actually put that back and then like create uh, create a, a mental uh, arena to myself. So this was also one of the challenges that I had uh, while uh, in the uh, learning process. Uh, so the other 
challenge I had is that, yes, as an Ethiopian, we had indigenous knowledge. So like there is a local way of teaching theology. There are local uh, resources. Uh, but I had a very big challenge integrating those indigenous knowledges to that uh, kind of methodology that is already in place in the uh, Western area. So yes, I do understand that that is my challenge, uh, bridging the two worlds together, bringing them together. Uh, that was a challenge, but uh, some of the teachers also has actually helped us in this matter, uh, really like involving us in, uh, in actually contextualizing our local knowledge to the current education that is being given. Uh, so uh, the other one is the, I think I'm going to come to my uh, third uh, point. The third stage uh, was uh, working on my research, my thesis writing process. I'm actually in that uh, process, just like I have uh, presented in my, uh, in the previous uh, point, the concept of uh, the idea of translating certain concepts from my understanding to the teachers. Now, uh, first the teacher was actually communicating ideas to me. Now I actually have to collect my ideas and put ideas to teachers. So I'm still being challenged in translating certain mindsets, certain attitudes, certain philosophical uh, frameworks from my indigenous knowledge to the other, uh, to, to my teachers, to my lecturers. So this is still, I'm still being challenged. So uh, maybe adding a, a little point here, uh, when I say translating, I'm not just talking about translating the language, uh, translating the content, but I'm also talking about translating the mindset. Uh, because I think when we communicate, we don't only communicate uh, content, we actually communicate our whole self. I think Oscar was also mentioning that somehow our whole humanity is uh, encompassed in what we're trying to uh, communicate. So when we try to communi communicate, these things are very important because I see it's very, I see it being missed in most of our conversations. I'm trying to say something and the other person is trying to say something. But if I was talking this to an Ethiopian student, he would understand me, not because of language barrier, but because of the barrier that exists, like the philosophical mindset. So uh, this was a challenge. I'm still facing uh, this challenge. Uh, and also in my thesis uh, process, like resources are still, I'm still being challenged uh, by those. Yes, we do find a work around them, but uh, this actually takes a lot of time. Uh, like, for example, if you want to quote an author, if you already, uh, if you want to quote an author, you either have to find the book or have to find the research. And like, most of the time we don't have access, as Romina mentioned, access to many libraries. So like, either we have to like, dig a, dig a lot <laughs> to find a pirated option, which is really not legal. So like, it's always, we have to come back and forth uh, in this uh, Area. So these are uh, uh, mostly the challenges that uh, I have faced. Uh, but regarding uh, uh, inequality, uh, one uh, experience that I had is that... Uh, Salam, I'm sorry, yes. just a couple more minutes, please. Yes, I'm actually finishing okay. up. Uh, yeah, so one of the challenges that I actually faced is that uh, in the uh, pandemics when I was learning, for example, it's a very simple problem, but it's uh, it's actually I saw it being magnified in in a lot of other students' house too. I shared my room with my sister, but now I have a class. While actually learning, my sister is going to be also learning. So uh, rather than, for example, if I was in school, I didn't actually. If I was in a face-to-face -face school, I, I wouldn't face this. I'm in my class, and my sister is also in her class. But since now I'm sharing my class with her, I'm I'm going to be disturbed. She's going to be disturbed. This kind of things we might not see them as like uh, in, uh, uh, problems in uh, the digital uh, uh, area, but. It's one of the problems that I have faced. Uh, so if there's any questions, I'm free to entertain them. I hope my boring voice hasn't really bored you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's fantastic, Salam, and far from boring. I mean, we I could have listened to you certainly for, for much, much longer because that is such, such a genuine account of, of a, you know, a learner in, in one part of the world and, and the challenges, some of which don't really necessarily translate very well to, to the people in the other parts of the world, those transmitting the knowledge. 
you know, you talk about issues such as that communicating of mindsets, and, and it's not just to do with language, but it's also just that understanding of, of context and, and the local, you know, the, the local knowledge and the local context and how that fits into the frameworks that might be existing in whichever academic institution you're dealing with. So some of these are really quite, quite challenging, quite, quite fundamental issues around, around education and particularly when you're thinking about the online, there's, there's that additional, additional layer. So thank you so much, um, Salam. Now we don't have, sorry, we don't have a huge amount of time. We've got 10 minutes before we come to, um, to the close of the session. So what I would like to do is perhaps I'll just pick on a couple of questions that are in the Q&A um, section. This is a session that should have carried on for another half hour at the very least, because we have so much to talk about. So if that's all right with the speakers, I'll just um, pick on a couple of questions um, and, and we'll answer those and then we'll, we'll see how, how we get on, how far we go. So the first question um, from Gurunam Singh, there's a question here for you, Oscar. And now Gurunam is asking about, um, given the pervasive and powerful nature of coloniality and modernity, he's asking, are we running the danger of denying the possibility of anti-colonial agency? And if not, how can we, or how do we curate and understand that agency? Okay, so thank you very much. I, uh, it was a very complex question. I was really trying yes. to digest. It takes you back to those philosophical uh, classes. But um, um, what I'd like to do first before I answer that question is, is just go back to um, what um, uh, Salim said. Um, the question she had about, uh, she could not connect what she had online or the online uh, learning education to what was outside, you know, um, her, in, in a local setting. Now that for me is the outworking of modernity coloniality because what modernity coloniality says is that, that the world outside the online education doesn't exist. I think that's important to understand. It assumes that there is no education in Ethiopia outside the classroom. And I think what we need to do is to actually go back to the fundamentals of this question. What does education mean? What does learning mean? You know, So the, the African child only learns when they go in that box called the classroom. What about the keto that they, they have in, in Ethiopia? Isn't that applied mathematics when you're counting them? If you have a, a child in Ethiopia who's able to count 100 cows using some kind of a formula, how do we connect that to mathematics that happens in the classroom and the experience that they have online? So the, the, you know, so this question then is important for us to, it, it allows us to see the practical example of what happens when modernity coloniality erases other ways of knowing and uh, you know, declares them as invisible. And what we should be doing is to actually understand that mechanism and actually challenge it. Start to talk about the visibility of Ethiopian education outside the classroom. The education from the elders. What do you learn from the elders? And can you as an Ethiopian actually see that as important in your community and praise, you know, uh, actually try to praise it. So I'll, I'll go to the question um, uh, that, that I have here. So, so the question is, uh, 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 the agency are we are, are we are, are we losing this uh, anti-colonial agency? And I actually think my response goes back to my presentation. We we are actually promoting that agency. How are we doing it? We are doing it by identifying these mechanisms of coloniality, and these mechanisms of coloniality, for instance, are about visibility. What coloniality declares as visible? What coloniality declares as real, education-wise and in other ways? we have accepted over the years. So then we're gonna struggle with publication. I can't publish in England uh, or in a journal in England because that is what is real. Well, if I produce education, if I produce material which is relevant in my context and we solve a problem in my context, you know what? Maybe it's not, pub it's not meeting the publishing standards, but it's actually solving a problem and education has to do with my own existence and how I solve my problems. So I see that there is still room in there when we understand these mechanisms of representation, mechanisms of, of appropriation, we can begin to promote the anti-colonial agency by saying it does exist. Modern coloniality says it doesn't exist. We say this world actually exists and it's real. It's real because uh, uh, the, the, the African, uh, the, the model of where we, the way we understand uh, maybe the, the, the global South is always the deficiency model. Even what we're talking about today, they don't have this. They don't have this. That, well, you know what? Maybe they didn't have that, but when they, there was a disruption because of COVID, 
they had the outdoors and the children in England didn't have the outdoors. So if we had from the initial education told them that actually every time you walk to school, you are learning, if you see your surrounding, they would have started to apply the biology they learned in class by seeing what they have in the vegetation around their, their home. Learning would have continued, but education, schooling would have stopped. So we would have now been talking about an African child and what they benefited compared to the European child or the Western child and what they didn't have. But the, the whole idea of looking at Africa or the global South in its deficiencies is, 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 is an outworking of modernity coloniality. Thank you. Thanks very much, Oscar. Romina or Salam, did, you, did either of you have anything to add to that? Any thoughts around this? It's fine if not, we can move on to another question. Okay. Right. Okay. So um, there was a question here, um, Salam, which I thought you might you might find interesting, and um, it's from Kate Bird. Thank you, Kate. So Kate says um, Kate is is interested to hear you refer to your knowledge as indigenous, and the question is really: Do you mean by indigenous? Do you mean Ethiopian? Do you mean black? And you know, is it representative of Ethiopian epistemologies and ontologies? And she, the question really is. She knows black Canadian thinkers who refuse to use the term indigenous when referring to knowledge produced by people from the majority world. So I guess there seems to be, she, she, the, she wants to have an understanding of what you mean by indigenous. Yes, so thank you, Kate. That's a very interesting question. So what I've meant when I say indigenous is that the Ethiopian theological knowledge, uh, it's very local. Uh, it's very it's very old and it has its own way it has developed through the years and what I mean is the Ethiopian uh, uh, knowledge development process specifically related to theology because when I say theology it has really also affected like how the uh, Ethiopians speak even in the modern uh, sense so that's what I mean so it, it has also uh, somehow uh, affected the overall understanding because most of the time the indigenous knowledge really focuses on like cosmology uh, and then even when we refer to the methodology it's really uh, it's really oral so we most of the time we don't use books so it, it's really oral so for example for someone to uh, finish a certain education uh, in order for him to pass from one state to, to another it means that he has to uh, or uh, like he has to finish, everything has to be learned and everything has to be said orally. So this is a very different uh, approach from anywhere uh, in the world. So when I say indigenous, it's those uh, processes, those uh, somehow cosmological approaches. So it's very unique, that's what I say. So referring to the black Canadian who would uh, who refuse to use that, maybe he, ha I'm really not sure uh, what is meant there, but, uh, that's what I said when I meant indigenous, like the Ethiopian knowledge. Yes, it's black knowledge, but specifically this. Fantastic. Thank you, Salam, for that. Um, any anybody want to add to that, Romina or Oscar? Did you have any views about indigenous and 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 definitions of that? Right. Well, colleagues, I'm afraid it's we've got two minutes before we finish, so we really have genuinely run out of time. Um, there are a number of comments in the Q&A um, box. Perhaps if any of the speakers would like to respond to any of them, that would be great um, by chat. We, we might be able to give responses to that. But I think we will have to draw the session to a close. And what I would like to do before I close the session is to give my thanks to the speakers because there's a really great, fantastic, thought-provoking um, presentations. Big clap. There's lots of virtual clapping going on and very deservedly so. So thank you all and, and thank you for the time taken to, to help us to think about some of these things. Hopefully we might be able to have another opportunity to, to talk a, a bit more about these things because there's, there's a lot to be said. Um, and it's clearly difficult to talk about digital, just the digital space without thinking about so many other contexts and, and issues around um, decolonizing. My thanks to Claire, to Linda, to Julian for organizing this and for having us today. And perhaps shall I hand over to Claire to, to say the final word or to Linda, if anybody has anything to say? 
Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I mean, this was absolutely brilliant. It was really electrifying when you're listening to that. And I'm really sorry that we didn't have more time to to just really to dig down to to get to some of the bottom of these things. So but I, I think I can speak for everyone that I think there's a lot of really great stuff that's been that we can take away from this into this journey of decolonization. So thank you very much. And thank you, Christine, for your um, brilliant and adept sharing and, and to Shireen for putting this um, panel together. Thanks very much, everyone.